Hi guys, it is a lovely day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in the Green Mountains of Vermont, but here on the middle of the summer of 2019, but we're going to head just a little bit west of here to somewhere around Chicago, Illinois, I believe, which is not quite as cool and pleasant as Vermont today, where I have the great honor of finally speaking with Julia Adonai Thomas. And if you are do not remember, I've read a couple of Julia's essays here on Collapse Chronicles, but just to refresh your memory, Julia is an associate professor of history at Notre Dame University. Uh, she has her own PhD, I assume, in history from the University of Chicago, and the themes that she concentrates on are environmental, intellectual, and political themes, bringing critical theory to bear on questions of power in modern societies. Julia Thomas investigates concepts of nature and Japanese political ideology, the impact of the climate crisis on historiography and photography as a political practice. This is, this is quite the varied resume. Before joining the history faculty at Notre Dame, Julia taught at the University of Illinois at Chicago and the University of Wisconsin. And I could go on and on with this, but uh, I want to bring Julia on to say hello to the folks, and then we are just going to dive right into this rollicking conversation about history in the Anthropocene. So come on and say hello to the folks, Julia. Um, hi, Sam, and, and hi to everybody. Uh, okay, so, so Julia, let, let's just start off this way. I have said many times, usually to a roll of the eyeballs, that I honestly believe where we are today, as you and I are having this conversation, I honestly believe we are at the most exciting point in human history since we climbed down from the trees, that what is happening as we transition from the Holocene to the Anthropocene is bigger than the invention of fire, the invention of agriculture, the Industrial Revolution, and every war we have ever, ever fought combined. I honestly believe this. How Do you think I'm being uh, a, a little bit dramatic, or do you agree with me? How would you define this point in history in the human race? Well, Sam, I think you're absolutely right that we have entered an unprecedented state. This is, this is a world we've never known before. And I don't know whether I would call it exciting, because that suggests something we might like to be. Yeah involved in, but um, what is interesting to my mind is to compare this Anthropocene transition with the, some of the earlier transitions that you mentioned. And one of the interesting ones is how we entered the Holocene. It used to be that people, that our ancestors and our ancestor species were dealing with great changes and the glaciers were coming down and they were dealing with all this cold weather and back and forth. And then the earth tilted the right way, the sun got in the right spot, and it was sweet. We had a relatively stable earth for 11 millennia, 11,000 years. That's a long time. But we didn't have anything to do with that. That wasn't something we human beings did. But what makes this event, this rupture of the earth system in the mid 20th century so strange is that it was produced by human activities and we've never done anything like that and you are absolutely right this is certainly one of the most interesting times that we have ever lived through i um yeah i don't know what more to say about how to characterize the um the sense that I feel and when I think about this, because you've used the word exciting, I've just used the word interesting. 
It is certainly both those things from an intellectual perspective. But my sense is that we are going to be facing rougher decades for our uh, societies and our access to water and our access to food and our treatment of one another and our uh, levels of violence than we've ever experienced before. I know that sounds grim, but I think you share my, my uh, worries. Y y y yes, I do. Let, I just want to read a paragraph from, from one of your many fine essays that I've been reading the past few days. Y y you wrote, I'm not sure what year you wrote this, the new circumstances of the Anthropocene are forecast to be so different that the political, moral, social, and cultural understanding gained from most studies of the past may no longer be of any import. Accordingly, new global studies must do more than show us that history in ignoring environmental factors has largely misapprehended how we got to where we are. They must also actively recover cultural and political resources that will help meet the challenge of climate collapse and provide a humanistic and sustainable story about how we might go forward. In sum, in challenging our understanding of what has happened, the new global environmental awareness challenges our previous modes of representing what happened, dethroning traditional ideas about the subject of history and its hopes. We find ourselves radically redefined as actors on a radically altered stage. And that absolutely is one of the best summations that I have ever read about where we are right now, Julia. So just give us, just take a rip on this about being a historian at this point in human history, how is the Anthropocene going to change just the whole approach that historians take to their field of study. My, my sense, uh, Sam, is that this is the moment where history has to uh, history has to transform itself. History has always been about telling stories about the things in the past, so that we could show that we don't have to live like we live in the present and therefore could create a better world. It was a way of telling stories about progress, in other words, that things were bad in the past, but there was possibilities for redistributing power and creating greater justice. And we could tell a happy story about what it meant to be a human being and create societies. And a lot of that was fed by the bounty that people were able to use uh, as they developed more and more complex societies, as they developed agriculture, as they created cities, as they began to master the microbiome so that we became healthier and healthier, so that by the year 1800, there were a billion human beings in the planet. And we began to be able to think of ourselves as a species that was moving, or societies that were moving, into a better world. And what is so frightening about the Anthropocene is those dreams of bounty are now burst. And along with them, the hopes that through bounty we could create justice, that this would be an easy way of raising everybody up. But we've come to the limits of that bounty. We are beyond the limits of that bounty in many cases. We've gone beyond the planetary limits and the amount of nitrogen that we pour into the land and into, ultimately into the oceans. We've gone beyond the planetary boundaries in terms of land use change. We can't pour more concrete and dig more mines and spread more of our industrial complex around the world. We're just not going to be able to do that anymore. 
And therefore, the great promise of progress that was part of the historical practice, that through abundance we could create a better world, is just no longer available to us. And that really raises the question, why do history? Why look at the past? And I think there are a number of ways uh, of thinking about that. One is to say, okay, history can tell us that we messed up. We, we thought we didn't really have to have uh, a sense of self that was related to the natural world. We could just tell the story of human beings and ignore other creatures, the air, the water, the land. We were just transcending. We could dematerialize ourselves. And we could tell a history that says, how sad, how sad is that? This great uh, hope that was really just an illusion. We were probably out of our minds. And then history just becomes elegy. But I think there's something really important that history can do, which is to say, okay, our stories of progress were wrong. Our stories of progress in the sense of material abundance being infinite, um, our, our story of progress in the sense that we could dominate the world more and more and that would be good for us, those stories are over. But there are a lot of other stories that we didn't focus on that we can now turn to and think about those societies that were left out of modernity, that did things a different way, that valued human connections and friendships and time rather than material goods. And I think when you start looking for those stories, they're all over the place. Because it took a lot of effort to get people to think that money should be the driving force in their life. It took a lot of effort to persuade people that they wanted to work 70 hours a day. It took a lot of effort to persuade people to have clocks and to think of their lives as measured and managed rather than and lived and responded to in the moment. And so those implements of modernity that created these cages around us, were actually resisted for a long time. And if we look back at the past, we can see some of those. And we can say that human beings have lived differently in the past, and in some ways better in the past than we do today with less. Because what the Anthropocene teaches us is that we need to uh, engage in degrowth. We need to stop growing. We need to live for values beyond material ones. At least that's what I think. Okay, okay since, you, since you bring up the, the, the word Anthropocene, which is something we, we talk about uh, a lot on this channel with, a, with a, a lot of the people I interview, but I notice that everyone that I interview has a little bit different definition uh, of the Anthropocene. So I'm always curious to see I mean, <laughs> subtle but, but important differences. So what is your working definition of, uh, of the Anthropocene and, and, and what does it encompass or not encompass? Just give us, when, when you're saying Anthropocene, what are you talking about, uh, essentially? Well, that's a really important question because certainly that word has entered a lot of fields and a lot of different things. And as you say, a lot of people use it in different ways. When I use the word, I defer to the people in geology who are trying to frame this concept. I'm not a, a geologist. I wouldn't pretend to be an earth scientist. But it seems to me important to at least get a handle on what they're telling us and not to define the Anthropocene for history and art history and sociology and whatever. 
uh, else. And so let me let me sort of work through this a little bit. It might be helpful. Um, the Anthropocene uh, Working Group was formed in 2009. And on May of this year, May 21st, 2019, there was a press release saying that they'd had a binding vote of 88% of their membership on the committee that they were going to pursue a formal proposal to the great geological bureaucracy to confirm the fact of the Anthropocene. Okay, that sounds really bureaucratic, and it is. And what the way geologists work really interests me, because what they're saying is that we've spent 10 years trying to measure and figure out what is happening to the entire Earth system. And what, we, what they think is happening is that the entire Earth system, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the, uh, the terra sphere, the Earth, um, the biosphere, all of it working together has been in one state and is now entering a new state. And it entered that new state in the mid 20th century with the great acceleration of human population, that's the first factor, industrialization, that's the second factor, and globalization. So population, industrialization, and globalization in their acceleration in the mid 20th century pushed the Earth system into a new state. And how do we see that geologically? Well, I can't, I can't see that at all geologically, because as I say, I'm not a geologist. But what the geologists say is that this is confirmed in the strata in our, on our planet and the surface of our planet uh, by new fossils um, and, and plastics and a host of other things but particularly by the artificial radionucleotides that were um, spread around the globe almost at the same time through nuclear testing. And so what they're proposing to do now is to go find that marker that they call a GSSP. And once they found that, this will be a formal proposal that then has to go through four layers of bureaucracy to be confirmed. Now, why have I gone through all that? Well, be, I'm going through this because although I'm a humanist, I think it's very important to let scientists have their say. There have been a lot of attacks on science recently, but science uh, is quite, the scientists that I know and I'm working with Anthropocene Working Group members, Jan Zalasevich and Mark Williams, to write a book. So I do know something about the way these guys work. They're not after fame and glory. They're not making a political argument. They're wonks. They are looking to find uh, G, uh, what they call a chronostratigraphic marker on the, on the surface of this planet that will demonstrate that we've entered in the sphere. And so I think it's really important to respect that knowledge, to try to understand that knowledge, and to recognize that that knowledge doesn't uh, tell us how to respond as political actors or as artists or as any of the other things we might do. That's simply a description of the reality that we face. And it's a pretty scary one. So. I take that on board, and then I say, what can I do as an historian? What is my role as somebody who thinks a lot about the kinds of values that human beings hold, that, is really, that I'm somebody who's really interested in the way meaning changes, um, why we tell the stories we tell each other, how we talk about our lives as being uh, lives that have value, how we talk about our societies as being good societies or bad societies. These are all value judgments 
These are all about our ethical perspectives and our, and our political perspectives. And the question is, how do we connect those practices, which are about the meaningfulness of human life, with this description of the realities of geostrategy. And this is, and the, cha this is the challenge of historians on the eve of the Anthropocene. Is that, that, it, that is your and your colleagues challenge. Do you, do you think a, a lot of uh, historians are, are recognizing the momentousness of, of this event and are shifting their priorities accordingly? Or is this going to take some work on the part of people like you to say, hey guys, we need to be paying more attention to what's uh, unfolding out here and responding to it? Well, that's a wonderful question, and I know uh, you've talked to a good number of historians, and you might have your own views. My sense is that, as a profession, we are really behind the curve. I think most of us are trained to look at written documents. In fact, I know most of us are trained to look at written documents. We want to tell human stories, the change of change over time that happens in human societies. And I think that this, the magnitude of the Anthropocene is very difficult for historians to take on. And so some of us are beginning to do this in our research. But the real question becomes, how do we change our teaching so that we're actually teaching our students about the world to come, not training them for a world that's vanishing. And that means, in part, changing the structures of universities. And that is very difficult to do from the bottom up. People major in different disciplines, the sciences are separated from the humanities, are separated from the social sciences. Um, we train people at elite universities in particular to do well in the economy that is based on growth. And if we can't have that economy anymore, if this world of complexity that is fueled by fossil fuels and, and ever ending, never ending growth is actually not the world that we should be training our students for, how on earth do we change things for that? And so there are three levels at which historians need to do some rethinking. One is just in their own research, one is in their teaching, and the third way is institutionally. And that's, it's very, very difficult to do. But I would say that we're beginning to do this. And one of the things I'm doing right now is putting together a special forum on Anthropocene history with a bunch of super smart, wonderful colleagues for the American Historical Review. Um, now, that's not a journal that many people read outside the profession, but the hope is to, to make a little bit of space within the profession to talk about the Anthropocene. Now you mentioned that you uh, were we're co-authoring an upcoming book. Can you? Is it early and is is it late enough in the process for you to discuss that? Is it going to be for a popular lay audience, or a, or a more scholarly text? What? Tell us a little bit about what we can expect uh, when that book comes out. Well, thank you, uh, Sam. I'm pretty excited about this book. I, this is a, a co-authored book. Myself and Jan Zolosevic and Mark Williams from the Anthropocene Working Group. So here you have a Japan historian and two geologists. And we're trying to write an introductory text. And we've had such fun doing this. It's going to come out next spring from Polity Press. And the name of the book is The Anthropocene, a Multidisciplinary Introduction or no, it's the multidisciplinary approach. Um, and it has been a really interesting process. We've, we've really enjoyed working with one another. 
But we've also found out how difficult it is to write for a general audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, you asked whether this was going to be for, you know, the general reader. And, of course, that's what you who, that's who you want to reach. You want to be able to talk to your neighbor. That's a democratic act. Explain to them why you think these things are important. And what I found working with these scientists is that we use a lot of words differently. So there's going to be chapters on uh, geology and biology and a number of scientific uh, ways of thinking about the Anthropocene. And then I'm going to write about politics and economics and what we might do to uh, mitigate the Anthropocene. And so we're changing chapters back and forth. I'm reading their work. I'm editing. They're doing the same thing. And they will go through one of my texts, for instance, and they will capitalize Earth absolutely in every place, right? Because when they say the word Earth, which, you know, everybody uses a lot every day, um, they think about the third planet from the sun. But when I talk about Earth, you know, sometimes I'm talking about the dirt in the ground, but a lot of times I'm just sort of thinking about the Earth in general. Mm -hmm. And I think when I try to give an example of Earth in a kind of humanistic sense, of that moment in Shakespeare's play Hamlet, where he turns to his friend Horatio, and he says, you know, Horatio, there are more things under heaven and earth than are dreamed of in your philosophy. And what he means by that isn't there are more things on the third planet from the sun and its upper atmosphere than are dreamed of in your philosophy. What he means is, you know, the world. And so that means that in writing with scientists, it's really hard to find a language which is both accurate, because we want to get it right, and make sense to both people who know science and people who know the humanities and social sciences. So trying to do that has been um, a marvelous and exciting challenge. And we'll see, we'll see what the readers think when it comes out next spring. But I hope we've managed to find a way of really talking to people. Well, we definitely will, will have a, uh, a, a follow-up talk when, when that does come out. I, w while we're on the Anthropocene, I, I don't want to let it slip through the cracks. One of the essays I read out recently on, um, on Collapse Chronicles, which some of these listeners may recall is the uh, is the article you wrote just making sure that people understand why while climate change is certainly a major player here in the Anthropocene that don't let it be forgotten that it is just one player there are more players on the team and I just, again, I just want to, uh, j just to touch on that uh, essay where, you know, you, you, you kind of expand this out and just so make sure that, re that readers understand that the Anthropocene requires a new way of thinking. The Anthropocene is a multi-dimensional challenge. Our future is more unpredictable than ever. And so just, just run with, 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 with that a few minutes and, and try to clear up. Because I do think that, that a few people are waking up to climate change, which is, which is good. It's a good wedge into the larger discussion. But open up that wedge a little bit more, uh, Julia, and and tell you know try to explain to people why climate change is not the only thing that you and others are talking about when talking about the Anthropocene. Yeah, Sam, I, I thank you for that question. One of the things um, that you know well, and I expect um, are our listeners do as, as uh, also is that, that you're right climate change has been a hard sell there's been a lot of resistance in the united states particularly 
And it seems as though we're barely getting that issue on the table. And that's a good thing. I am for certainly discussing climate change because it is such a, 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 an important part of this whole picture that we're looking at. But what I've noticed is that some of uh, some very powerful people, some of our leaders, some uh, of our public intellectuals, have picked up on climate change. And they think that they believe it's an important issue, but they reduce it to things like um, CO2 emissions from our cars and from our factories. And then they ignore things like the fact that most uh, greenhouse gases are emitted through extractive industry. So when you go mining, when you uh, move, uh, uh, agriculture does uh, emits uh, greenhouse gases. These kind of industries are also producing climate change. So people take climate change, they reduce it to CO2, from, only from cars and from uh, uh, energy plants. And then they say, we can solve this problem. And they start in on things like solar and wind and thermal and tidal energy. And those are, those are probably going to be useful in the mix. But the thing that frightens me is phrases like those phrases that are in Jeffrey Sachs's book, and he's a uh, a famous economist out of Harvard. Jeffrey Sachs will tell us that if we use this green, new green energy, we can dematerialize the economy. So if we go, for instance, to wind power, we can save ourselves and we can continue to grow our economy and we can continue along the same path that we've been going on all along. But if you look hard at wind energy, you'll notice that it's not dematerialized. It's made of materials. It's made of, of course, of metals. It would run the blades. It needs batteries that take rare earth metals. It needs a lot of fossil fuel to move these components around. The rare earth metals are mined, uh, particularly in China, where vast stretches of the land have been destroyed. And therefore, so too has the, the life support systems of plants and animals and pe the people who live there. And so these, these, this green energy is not separate from our planet and our planet's biosystem and our planet's uh, land, the, the land use problem. And so the focus on climate change alone has worried me because it's now become a solvable problem so that we don't have to change our ways of living. We don't have to change our economy. We don't have to change what uh, we think of as a good society. And I think that's wrong. And I worry about that. So I want to, rec I want to use the, the, the notion of climate change, as you say, as a wedge issue. I think people do understand that the hot days, we're going to have 105 tomorrow in Chicago, um, are uh, novel and really frightening and, and cause all sorts of problems. But it's not the only thing going on. We need land. We need other plants. I mean, we need plants. We need animals. We need all sorts of things to work. We need a water system. Um, and it's not just climate change. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm glad you are, are 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 making that point. I mean, obviously, it's good that that climate change is finally penetrating the news. But if you but if you're aware of all of the other planetary boundaries and the limits to growth, and everything else, you know, I, I've I've had people make the claim, and 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 I think this is true that that if climate change was completely taken off the table. And, and and it was not a problem. Uh, there's still enough 
problems go going on that need addressing that people are completely unaware of th that it might take a few years longer but it would still get us to the same place which is the the brick wall waiting for us at the uh, at the end of our limits to growth is, is I think that's what you're you, you're you're trying to say uh, that's my understanding Sam you know one of the things that really frightens me um, is this the loss of topsoil we cannot feed ourselves without without soil and enormous amounts of that is being washed away our industrial agricultural techniques don't build soil they don't let the soil rest they don't um, allow it to, to regenerate and, and become more nutrient uh, uh, more filled with nutrients um, and you know we can't we can't not eat that's not optional <laughs> no. and, and you know I just look at some of these these this notion that we, the only thing that we have to worry about is our, our cars and our uh, fuel factories I mean that's not that's not all there is to it Okay, there's there, there there's so many places I want to go on in this uh, in, in this discussion, and yet we're 36 minutes into it. I I could just never resist asking this question whenever I'm interviewing any sort of historian. Uh, I I know historians are are loath to make predictions, so I'm not asking you to make a prediction here. I I, I let me let me phrase this question so. Just what is your hazy, if, if you were writing a novel and your main character was a historian in the year 2100, looking back and try, assuming there are any historians uh, in 2100, and, and, and looking back and trying to explain what happened in the 21st century, what would what would that the brief outline of your uh, of your novel uh, and your main character sound like? Oh gracious, that's a hard one. Um, I I think there is, there are places for hope, and I'll tell you what I'm what it makes me think. If I were to look back from twenty one hundred at our time now, the places that I would look would be the return to a simpler way of life, uh, a, a greater engagement with community. And where I'm finding that, Sam, is in Appalachia. I grew up uh, in, on near the Virginia-Tennessee border. And so it's a country where People used to get their living out of trains and tobacco and coal. And those industries are not where we're going anymore. And the, there are groups of people there that are resolving to live a different way. And it's not an easy way. I'm not saying that, you know, this is a sort of paradise of some kind. But they're be beginning to form organic farming cooperatives. Part of that has been funded by Barbara Kingsolver's work uh, and that in the work of her husband who teaches at a little college called Emory and Henry College, which is very near to, to where I grew up. And when I look at those people, I see ways in which we can construct communities that work. Now, do I think that that's where our society is tending now? Or do I think that in the next 10 or 15 years that we have to turn things around, we're likely to get there. I can't say I'm very optimistic, but I do think there are going to be pockets of decency that will be able to resist some of the worst trends that we're going to face, partly because of the strength of community. And I think that that's worth thinking about. Because otherwise, it just looks so bleak to me that the thing I want to say to you is, yes, looking back on 2100, we'll just want to rend our clothes and pull our hair out and uh, scream at the past for having been such knuckleheads. Um, and that's not, a, that's not a happy story. So I, I, I 
think if I were to uh, to try to t tell a story of hope, it would be a story that function that focuses on on community and reduced materialism. But, but what, whatever story you're telling, uh, is is it safe to say one probably one of the few things of that, that pretty much everyone I've interviewed agreed on, no matter what their story is and their visions of of life in the year 2100 it does not include a planet of 10 to 12 billion people um that's what they're that's what they're suggesting we're headed for and i am um that would be pretty catastrophic the anthropocene working group has in its press release that i mentioned earlier it actually says Population growth is driving this, and that's an important thing to say. That population uh, growth is dry, driving is the driving word. the Anthropocene. It's driving the transformation of the planet, and I'm just astounded when people are shocked to talk about population and claim that people that are worried about population growth don't love babies and want people to flourish. In fact, it's because we love human, our fellow human beings that we recognize that people are not going to be able to flourish with 11 billion of us on this planet. And what I am conscious of when I say this is how much trouble you can get into uh, by making that claim. And I suspect you've, you've gotten into some trouble about that um, because it I don't mean to frame it as suggesting that some group is more important than any other group. Um, what I'm suggesting is that we can uh, choose to have a smaller population and actually learn to treat one another better and bring up the children that we raise in a flourishing, a more flourishing world than in the one that we're headed towards with 11 billion. And it's not just about um, uh, the, the worries about feeding all those people. It's about the rise of new diseases. It's about the fact that we can't, um, as the world uh, warms, and if we go along as business as usual, as you, as you well know, that's about, what, four degrees more by 2100, and that's, what, 7.3 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. We're going to have to move out of vast sections of this planet because we're not going to be able to live there anymore. And once we do that, you're not only talking about a huge rise in population, but in a smaller area. And of course, as the seas rise, we'll get more advanced. Well, what I was driving at is, is, is the is the famous bottleneck that we're he headed. Like for all the reasons you just mentioned that it looks more and more apparent, at least to me and a lot of other people, that there's no way uh, there, there's going to be 11 billion people on this planet at the end of this century. Uh, or have you really plumbed the, the, the depths of this question in, in your own research? Well, I haven't looked at it uh, particularly in my own research in terms of, in terms of future prognosis. But what interests me is what the Japanese did earlier. And one of the things that some people seem to think is that if the population doesn't grow, we're not going to have a, a, a bountiful economy. But when you look back at Japan in the 18th century, the population remained stable. The population was about 30 million. And yet well-being, meaning how long people lived, how healthy they were, how many things they had through handicrafts and through trading, actually increased. So they lived better because they had learned to live within the ecology of the Japanese islands without their population growing. And that was an interesting moment in human history. It says we don't have to always grow our population when we get healthier and stronger. We can actually 
have fewer children. And of course, the Japanese didn't have the kinds of birth control that we do now. But they chose to get married later. They chose to go off and work away from the village that they were going to come back to and marry into. They would try to abstain, of course, from sex. That always is a good way of work of not having children. Um, actually, they were really interested in small families because they knew small families would allow them to live on the land that they had to live on. And I think if we realize that with our new, with our current birth control technologies and these other things that we have, we can actually have our population level off and then turn around earlier than that 11 billion figure that you that you use. And if people are, have access to birth control and have access to information, as you know from talking to Alan Weissman, they will choose the route of smaller, happier families with better education and better life chances. And that should be seen as a good thing. Do you see, as a historian who spends a lot of time researching Japan, do you see in the cards history repeating itself in Japan's future as, as so many people are, are pulling their hair out about the fact that Japan's population is actually falling, and you have mentioned in your own writing that you actually, and I am cheering you on when you're saying this, maybe this is actually a good thing that we could, that Japan could actually get down into a sustainable population within its, within its own carrying capacity, and maybe this could be a model uh, for, for the planet as we negotiate our way through the Anthropocene. Uh, talk about that for a minute, about why Japan is one of your few visions of hope, the way things are going there. Well, I think Japan could be one of our visions of hope because its population topped out at 126 million or thereabouts and it's now declining. And if the Japanese leadership were to look at the Anthropocene to truly understand our ecological challenges, they might say, terrific, we can be the model for the world's future. We have a strong civic society. We have a great infrastructure. We have an educated population. And we can figure out how to be the first really vibrant degrowth society on the planet. They have a lot going for them. They're an extraordinary people. And problem right now is that they can't get away from that notion that they have to continue to grow their economy, um, at least at the leadership level, can't get away from this notion. Abe Shinzo, is the current prime minister, is doing all sorts of things to uh, in, uh, increase the population or, or urge the population to increase. He's actually not been very successful at that. Um, they're bringing in some uh, migrant labor. But if the Japanese were to think of another goal besides that one of economic growth along the old models, I think they could, they could do some things that are really exciting. And on the sub-national level, at a lot of local uh, villages and provinces and places like Sado Island, local communities are accepting the fact that they're not going to grow. They're not going to be able to build the theme park that will bring tourists in, that will allow their economy to expand, that kind of stuff. What they're saying is, we're going to try to live more simply. We're going to accept the fact that the population is declining or stabilizing, and we're going to figure out how to make that work. And it's that reorientation of political goals and a sort of social imaginary that is is hard to do because even our language traps us into thinking that you know growth is good. Um, if we if we if we 
reorient ourselves, I think something really exciting could happen. And Japan is a place that could do it, and at some levels is doing it. And I think they actually had a chance to do it uh, with in the aftermath of the huge misfortunes of the Fukushima disaster, which, as you know, happened in March of 2011, when there was an earthquake and a tsunami and the nuclear meltdown. And so in the immediate aftermath of that, there was uh, almost 2,000 people died, and a great number of people had to be evacuated. But one of the happier aspects of that disaster was that the government asked people to conserve energy and because they were going to close, they were going to turn off all the other nuclear power plants because they were worried about how safe they were. And Japanese, Japan's energy use went down 30%. All they had to do was ask, and people responded. And that's pretty extraordinary. If the United States were to, to say, please turn off your lights, let's really make a deal of this, we might be able to do something like that. And Japan did it. But now it's crapped up. And now they're beginning to reopen the yeah. And now they're beginning to move people back into the Tohoku area. And I think that's a real shame, not only because that nuclear plant is continuing to melt down, there's still a lot of danger up there, but because with, with Japan's declining population, it might have been possible to consolidate the refugees from the Fukushima area into new local communities and begin to try to rewild that area and allow other species to come back. But unfortunately, that avenue has not been pursued. And a lot of the coastal communities moving back in now behind even higher barriers of poured concrete to block out future tsunamis and all the rest of it even though we know with the rising sea levels, that's a never-ending problem. You're never going to make yourself truly safe. So I think, I think that um, if there were better leadership in Japan, there'd be real opportunities for doing some wonderful things. And as with our own dear country, all you can do is hope and keep working and doing the kind of things that you are doing by, um, by bringing these issues to people's attention. Well, that's about what we can do, and I see we are good. We are 53 minutes into this, so uh, if you have listened to uh, any of my interviews all the way to the end, Julia, you know what I'm getting ready to inflict on you. If my last, my last question as I wrap up every one of my interviews here. If you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, giving you the microphone for one hour to uh, talk about your your vision of the planet uh, and where we need to be, and you actually had the mainstream media sticking a microphone in your face, and you had 60 seconds to send out the Julia Thomas message to humanity in the summer of 2019, what would that 60-second soundbite sound like? My gracious. I, um, that I need to think about. But I think 60 seconds. What would I say? I would say we have a new planet. We need a new society. That's what I would say. And with that society, we need a new economy, and a new sense of what human values are. So that's sixty seconds. Okay, that, that that you even put you even put it into thirty. So we will uh, we, we we will take that as an excellent beginning place for, uh, here in twenty nineteen and see where we can go. But Julia Thomas, uh, now stick around after we wrap this up here in a minute. But uh, before I sign off, I just want to say we really, really appreciate you taking an hour out of your busy schedule to come talk to us at Collapse Chronicles. And more and much more importantly, we really appreciate the uh, 
sometimes thankless work you are doing to uh, bring this message to a lot of people who might not want to hear it. And your work is really appreciated. And keep up the good fight. Thank you, Sam. You too. Bye, guys.